maritime nation. And quoting Mrs. Ruffhead, our Navy's global force for good. We are very honored to have Gary Admiral Ruffhead here as our guest speaker tonight. Admiral Ruffhead is a 1973 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and he became the 29th Chief of Naval Operations on September 29, 2007. The Chief of Naval Operations is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate for a four-year term. A member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CNO reports to the Secretary of the Navy with a focus on congressional relations. He has complex relationships with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense. He is President of Obama's Chief Naval Advisor. He has enormous influence. Please help me welcome Rear Admiral, Admiral Gary <laughs> Rowley. <laughs>
she was just finishing a lengthy refueling overhaul at Newport New Shipyard in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, she was on what uh, all of us kind of considered to be a green cruise. She was going to leave the shipyard, come down around South America, uh, and then come back up to her port uh, on the West Coast. Uh, but as we have done for centuries, uh, when the need arose uh, for the Navy, uh, we simply sent uh, the order to the Carl Benson to proceed at best speed uh, toward Haiti uh, to close the coast uh, in the vicinity of Mayport, Florida, uh, where at the same time we were moving helicopters from our squadrons uh, to fly to Mayport and then from Mayport get onto the aircraft carrier, and she became uh, the airport for the country of Haiti for all intents and purposes. Um, at the same time, uh, we ordered an amphibious ready group. We keep an amphibious ready group in a ready status on the East Coast, on the West Coast. We have them in 96 hour uh, ready to sail status. Uh, the amphibious ready group sailed in less than 48 hours. It's indicative of the way that our sailors respond. Uh, the hospital ship Comfort was in Baltimore. Uh, it too sailed faster than a hospital ship has ever responded to a disaster. We planned, as we were doing the initial planning, that Comfort would embark about 20 or about 200 medical personnel. We'd get her underway because we knew it would take time to, to pull people out of the various hospitals from which we draw the, the folks that man the ship. And that we also told her, close Mayport on your way south. Uh, but by the time she got ready to sail, all 500 medical people had found their way to Baltimore and were ready to sail with that ship. Uh, where we are right now, as we address the needs in Haiti, uh, we have around 20 ships that are committed, uh, not just the carrier, not just the amphibious ready group, uh, other amphibious ships. We have some destroyers down there. Uh, one of which uh, became the air control for uh, that part of the Caribbean uh, and also the control of the helicopters and, and all the other things that were trying to go in. And that ship, the USS Higgins, I think it also represents the flexibility of your Navy. It is a Pacific fleet ship that its most recent mission was providing ballistic missile defense in the eastern Mediterranean, and it was the first ship on scene in Haiti. Uh, if you want to talk about global reach, and the ability and the agility to do many different things of the Higgins uh, represents that. So uh, we can all be proud of what's taking place down there. It is a huge, huge undertaking and one uh, that is almost uh, unfathomable to imagine the distress that that country is going through. Uh, but the Navy is there, as are the other services, and we're going to be there for however long it is required there. Uh, I just happened the week before uh, to be in the Middle East where I spent some time out on the uh, USS Nimitz, uh, one of our great aircraft carriers and one that I've had the pleasure to deploy with uh, before in my career. And uh, she is finishing up an eight, eight month deployment. Uh, it is her third deployment in just over three years. But going aboard that ship, you would never know. The spirits were sky high, the sailors were locked on, the air wing providing anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of the air support over Afghanistan uh, is, is as committed to that mission on the last day of their cruise as they were on the first day of their cruise. They were just doing a terrific work. Went into Afghanistan where I've had the opportunity to visit uh, a few times over the last couple of years uh, to meet with our sailors uh, that are on the ground there. When you think of the Navy, you think of the ships, the submarines, the airplanes, the CBs, and others. But in the Middle East today, uh, we have 13,000 sailors on the ground. Uh, and they have been there for a couple of years. They are CBs, they're SEALs, they're medical people, but they're also uh, individual augmentees. Uh, as the need for uh, certain skills and capacity arose in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, we have begun to push our folks into that fight and they are doing extraordinarily well in everything that they do. There are provincial reconstruction teams in Afghanistan, 12 of which are manned by the United States. 
six, soon to be seven, are led uh, by the U.S. Navy. In fact, last winter when I was in Afghanistan, I was on a very cold mountain uh, talking to the leader of a provincial reconstruction team who happened to be a nuclear submarine. And I asked him, I said, when you got into this business, did you ever think that you and I would be on the mountain in Afghanistan uh, talking about building a clinic? And he said, no, but it is an absolutely terrific experience. And that's the response that I get from every single sailor that I talk to. And that's the response that I get from the commanders of the other services about the contributions that our sailors are making into that very, very important uh, fight that we have going on in the Middle East. A couple of years ago, we unveiled a maritime strategy. Uh, it is historic and for a couple of reasons. One, it's the first time that all three maritime services have signed up to it. Uh, myself, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and the Commandant of the Coast Guard all signed our name to the strategy. Uh, the strategy uh, codified uh, what we see uh, as the future, what we see as the capabilities that we need as a Navy uh, and as a nation. Uh, we are committed to being a forward deployed force ready to respond wherever that may be. I think some of the examples that I just talked about show you that that force is ready, and our people are ready, uh, to be a deterrent force. And a lot of times when you think of a deterrent force, you think of the strategic uh, nuclear deterrent that, uh, that we have in the Navy, that I consider to be, and I, many others consider to be the most survival leg of the nuclear triad. Uh, but it's more than that. It's the aircraft carrier showing up. It's the ballistic missile defense ship that happens to be stationed in places where, where people would want to do harm to others. Um, so we will remain that deterrent force. Uh, we'll exercise sea control and power projection uh, wherever that may be called upon uh, by the nation. But this strategy also called for two other areas uh, that we had not really uh, emphasized in the past. One is maritime security, and Dan touched on that. All the goods and services that flow and the resources that flow around, 90% are moving on the face of the ocean, on the surface of the ocean. And another thing that many folks don't understand is that there's about $3 trillion of trade a day um, that moves in this thing called cyberspace. And whenever I talk to people in the Pentagon about cyberspace, they'll put up a PowerPoint slide, and there are a lot of lightning bolts going up to satellites and then back down again. Um, but in point of fact, that $3 trillion of trade is moving on the ocean floor in cables that connect commerce and finance of the world over. Uh, that is the domain of the Navy, and, and we take that very, very seriously. Uh, the other area that we focused on was humanitarian assistance and disaster response. The shaping of the strategy really uh, was influenced a little a bit by the tsunami of 2004. And I happen to have the privilege of being in the Pacific Command when that tsunami struck. And we realized that the response that we mounted, not unlike what we're doing here at Haiti, uh, it was one that, uh, that, that would have been much easier had we had habitual relationships that we worked develop certain skills that we can bring to bear in a crisis. And so since 2004, in the aftermath of that tsunami, from our ships alone, as we have deployed them in the South Pacific, Southeast Asia, Africa, South America, from our ships alone, we have treated over half a million patients. Uh, we do that with our medical folks, with the medical staffs of the other services, We've also reached out to non-governmental organizations and developed relationships uh, with them, and they have partnered with us. And it has truly been, as you see in the television ads that we're showing right now, a global force for good. Uh, you have no idea what it means to someone uh, when they have the opportunity to receive medical treatment uh, that they never in their wildest dreams ever thought they would have. Uh, when you hear of grandmothers who, for the first time, see their grandchildren, uh, 
uh, when you have a young boy who, because of a bad burn, has not been able to walk for three years, and he goes aboard the hospital ship Mercy, and he walks off. Those are things that people will not forget, and those are things that really can change a life and change the direction of a country. So those are the capabilities that we've highlighted. We've also uh, said that we're going to focus in the Middle East and in the Western Pacific. Uh, as we were developing the strategy, there were some who said, no, we don't want to name specific areas because if you don't name an area, then maybe that would become problematic. And the position that I took was our economy is inextricably linked to the Middle East and to the Western Pacific. And as a Navy, we have to be focused on that. We have to understand what's going on there. We have to have a presence and we have to work closely with other countries. So we've worked very, very closely uh, with our friends and partners around the world. Every two years in Newport, Rhode Island, we do, we hold host an international sea power support. Four years ago, there were 67 countries. I hosted the last one in October of this past year. There were 102 countries that were there. There were 91 chiefs of service to talk about uh, how we can best work together as their forces flow into the relief area in Haiti. That's the type of relationship that has really begun to take hold and make a difference. Uh, what I do in D.C., um, as I used to say, I, I had the, I've had the privilege of commanding uh, fleets in the Atlantic and Pacific. Uh, now I drive budgets around. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but they, uh, they are extraordinarily important. They're important uh, for uh, three reasons. When I look at what I do, uh, I break my day down and I organize my thoughts into three things that I think are my job. One is to make sure that the Navy that we have today is ready for whatever they come at this point. Uh, are we giving the forces, the, the resources that they need? Are we training our people properly? Are we supporting the families at home so that when, when you do give someone 48 hours notice to sail, that they can sail knowing that their families are taken care of uh, and, and that the family has what they need uh, to live and to thrive when the, uh, the sailor is off doing the great work that they do. Uh, so I focus intently on that and as you look at what the Navy is doing today, uh, we can be proud of, of that ready Navy that we have. The other area is the Navy of tomorrow. And what should that Navy be? What is the environment that we will operate in? And that's one of the reasons, uh, in addition to joining you tonight while I'm on the West Coast, uh, I've been spending the last 24 hours uh, looking at some of the unmanned technologies uh, that are uh, centered out here in California, making sure that we're making the right decisions as we move forward as a Navy. Uh, this past year, I had the privilege of rolling out two new airplanes. P-8, which will take over from a P-3 maritime control airplane. Uh, that same week, we rolled out the carrier variant of the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, as we are here tonight, we have for the first time deployed uh, a vertical takeoff unmanned vehicle on one of our frigates that's conducting drug operations in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, we are flying in the Central Command a large unmanned aerial vehicle that's providing uh, extraordinary uh, situational awareness for our commander out there. Uh, our helicopter fleet is, uh, is, is probably as new as it has been in, in, in many, many years. Uh, so in the area of aviation, we're moving forward. And I'm very pleased, one of the things that we're doing here is looking at the first unmanned uh, initiatives that are in play to fly unmanned aircraft on our that's still uh, a few years in the future, uh, but there is nothing, nothing at all that has my attention more than the ability to begin the path um, to get an unmanned aircraft on the aircraft. In our, in our shipbuilding account, uh, the Virginia class submarine is a brand new submarine, extraordinary submarine. Uh, we have just started the redesign of the, of the replacement for the Ohio class ballistic missile. 
this past Saturday, I was in Mobile, Alabama, and placed in commission the, the second patrol combat ship. Uh, if you've seen pictures of it, it looks like something out of Star Wars. It doesn't look like a ship at all. Uh, and the young men and women who are on that are extremely proud and, and uh, pleased that they have a part, a part in it. We're building more ballistic missile defense capable uh, ships. Because as the President announced, uh, as the new strategy for uh, ballistic missile defense in Europe places the Navy squarely in the forefront of that. Uh, we're building high speed vessels that will allow us to move logistics more rapidly at sea. But probably the, the third thing that is most important to me is you know, all the ships, the airplanes, the submarines, um, really have uh, a value to the nation of zero. So we put people on it. And people are what make them what they are. And people cause them to do things that the designers didn't even think of. Uh, I have yet to visit a ship and look at a system where a sailor doesn't tell me you know, this is what the system was designed to do, but let me tell you what it really did. Um, and, and that's the beauty of the people that we have. Uh, right now, our retention is off the scale. Uh, our enlistments are off the scale. Uh, to be sure, the economy plays a role, but it's more than the economy. Uh, it's what we're doing, it's how we're doing it, and how we take care of the people. Uh, for all the businessmen in the uh, audience, just to give you sense of how off the scale the, the uh, re-enlistments are. Uh, in February of last year, my chief of uh, personnel came in and said, I need to talk to you. We have a little bit of a problem with our retention. Uh, he said, the models are no longer valid. They, he said, they're totally blown apart by the retention behavior that we're seeing. I said, great. He said, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> He said, well, I have a payroll problem. And I said, what is that? And he said, well, we're, if the projection pulls, uh, we're going to be $350 million short. Uh, and knowing that you always have to make payroll, uh, we had to do some pretty dramatic things. But we're still seeing that same type of, um, uh, of re-enlistment behavior. Uh, two months into the recruiting year, we had already recruited 50% of the people that we needed for the year. Uh, and that trend continues. As I said, the, the economy is a factor, but it is also uh, what we have also provided for our folks. We are extremely well compensated as a force. We have recently uh, been afforded the privilege and the opportunity to transfer the GI Bill education benefits that we receive as men and women who serve to our, to our children and to our spouses. That's huge. Um, we uh, in the Navy have put a great deal of emphasis on what I call the life work balance. And I'm sure that there are several of my predecessors that are spinning in their graves. Uh, because, my God, people can telecommute now. Uh, but uh, in many of the jobs, when we take someone who goes from sea duty and we put them in a staff assignment, particularly in our personnel command, most of their work involves pulling information off of the computer screen and talking to the constituent on the phone. Uh, so if that means that if I want to be co-located with my spouse and I can work for the personnel command in Millington, Tennessee, from Everett, Washington, why, why can't we do that? So we've been doing some things like that. We've opened up some sabbatical for making it easier for someone in the active component to move to the reserve pump and back again. So if there are things in their lives that cause them to say, I need to, uh, to, to change the, my circumstances, but I really love what I do, we're gonna provide the uh, opportunity, what we call change lanes for a period of time and come back in. Uh, as I said, your Navy is ready, your Navy is capable, uh, but as Dan mentioned, uh, if there's one area where where we need to pay attention is what I call capacity. We have the best technology in the world. Our ships, our airplanes, our submarines. Uh, you know, if there's somebody that wants to take us on, come on down. Uh, but what we need most is capacity. Uh, one ship can be in one place at one time. Uh, and so that's why, as, as I have 
been going without my job. It has been to grow the capacity of the Navy. The floor of 313 is where I have determined we need to be as far as the number of ships, uh, and we continue to drive toward that. Uh, but it is uh, its capacity is where I need your support. And as you talk about the Navy, and as you advocate for the Navy, uh, it, it is to, to give us the capacity that we need and the balance that we need. We can't simply be, you know, that, that ship is cheap, so let's go buy a bunch of those. It has to be balanced out uh, because uh, we have many, many local responsibilities and our Navy today is the same size as it was in 1960, 1-9, and our local interests and responsibilities are a little bit different than in 1960. Uh, so thank you for what you do, uh, for your support, not just of our young men and women who serve, but also for your advocacy of the Navy and what the Navy means to the nation and what it means to our safety, to our security, and to our prosperity. And with that, I'd like to open up for any questions that you have. The Navy League provides support to our men and women of the sea services around the world. With the help of individual and corporate members, the sea services become integrated into the local communities they serve and protect. In addition to providing support today to the men and women serving at home and abroad, the Navy League always looks to the future, to today's young people and tomorrow's leaders. The need for a strong, vital sea service, recognized by Theodore Roosevelt in 1902, is no less today. The challenges facing our nation have never been greater. More than 100 years later, the Navy League continues to answer the call. Your support makes a difference to our men and women of the sea services who serve today and will serve tomorrow in support of American sea power. As one secretary of the Navy said, the sun never sets on the Navy League.